Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Riff Heart Podcast. My guest today is a guitarist named Alyssa Day, who I have to say is one of the most impressive guitar players I've come across recently. Uh, literally, the day that I found her stuff is the day that I invited her on here. She is super impressive. I'm going to keep this intro short because we actually had a really good and long episode. We'll just get right into it. But you should go to Alyssa Day's Spotify as well as her Instagram and Facebook and just like watch her videos and listen to her. Uh, she is uh, a guitar player to watch in over the next few years for sure. All right, let's get into this. Alyssa Day, welcome to the Riff Hard Podcast. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. My pleasure. So I, uh, I heard about you not too long ago for the first time. Actually, not for the first time. I think you popped up in my feed at some point, like a year ago or something or something like that. Um, and I didn't pay attention because I don't pay attention <laughs> to a lot of stuff. But um, uh, sure. Justin McKinney brought you up the other day. I've been talking to him a lot because we just filmed some stuff with him and uh, I love his band. Um, and he said that you're super sick. So I went and I checked out your um, your videos and your EP and then was like, all right, I got to invite her on. So literally the same day that I actually checked your stuff out is the day that I hit you up and invited you on. Wow. I'm honored. It's really that's, impressive that's stuff. That's super cool. Oh, thanks, man. I am always shocked to hear that from especially great musicians. So thanks. Well, <laughs> thank you for the, for the compliment, but, uh, but why are you shocked? Uh, uh, geez, maybe that's for my inevitable future therapist to uncover. I don't know. Um, well, I don't know. I just don't, I never think of myself as being anything. I, I, I guess I'm just critical of myself typically is all. I, I think it's like, it's an important part of getting better actually. Cause, um, I, everyone I know who's done anything cool on the instrument or in music or really anything, didn't think they were all that, which is why they kept on trying to get better. Um, I've known a few people who did think that they were like God's gift to music and they weren't, they weren't that great. So like, yeah. I'm not shocked that you're shocked, I guess, <laughs> but I'm always, sure. I'm always curious to find out um, how someone feels about their own playing. Yeah. And I agree with that sentiment as well, or that observation is something that I share, I guess. Um, I've met pretty delusional people who also think they're like God's gift to the earth. And, uh, you know, they tend to be pretty complacent with their skill level. And I think that hunger and that self-criticism is really what tends to drive people. So it's a double-edged sword though. You can't let it be all consuming. Um, I'm sure most people struggle with titrating that and finding the balance there. But, uh, but yeah, I guess, I guess I am, I do fall into the category of somebody who's relatively critical of themselves. Uh, so yeah. What I get, I'm curious when you are in critical mode when it comes to guitar, I mean, really anything, but guitar specifically, um, is it something that then translates into, all right, we're going to, solve that by doing this, 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 and this, or is it just kind of like blanket, just feelings? Or I'm curious how it translates into what you then go do. Sure. Yeah. I guess that would be highly detrimental if it didn't actually manifest into any clear action to take. So I try to channel that into some pretty, uh, yeah, clear actions that I can take to actually improve the thing that I feel that I suck at or um, something that I just feel inadequate with, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's even video. Sometimes it's like, I need to learn how to do my hair better. That sucked. Uh, or like I gotta, you know, practice my alternate picking. Um, I'm not liking the clarity of the notes, uh, there it, it sort of manifests in all sorts of ways, but I like to, once I get that initial feeling, which can be overwhelming at times when you like listen to something back that you've recorded and you're, oh, yeah. you're unhappy with it. You just gotta, you gotta pinpoint what it is. Otherwise you're just sitting in this horrible feeling. Um, but then you can really channel that into something extremely positive 
if you can be explicit about what it is that you you can improve on or what it is that you don't like. And that's a fun process too, sort of uncovering what it is that you like and you don't like. Because sometimes you discover things about your own taste uh, during that process. So so it's a it's an overall good thing, I think. Um, yeah, but yeah, I agree. Uh, answer your question. I feel like I rambled. But. No, no, I, I think you, you answered the question very well, actually. All right. So let's just say that it is something like alternate picking or, or doing your hair. I don't know, but like either one. So you come across whatever it is that you just did or that you're, um, that I guess you're reviewing and are like, all right, not good enough. So that then what, like how to, then what is it like um is it kind of like an overarching idea when you then get to work again or is it like an actual plan like we're going to fix alternate picking by doing these five things for the next month sometimes it's pretty obvious and it sort of reveals itself easily what needs to be done um and yeah i guess i can point to a few times where it turned into this sort of all consuming obsession that lasted for months or even a year in terms of like improving a particular technique. Like I got obsessed, I think in 2020 with trying to work on my alternate picking. So I just did nothing but practice alternate picking for like a year. And then, um, the, the micro details, the actual steps involved in that, Um, like I said, kind of reveal themselves uh, if you're just scrutinizing when listening back or watching back to whatever you're doing. Sometimes the video component of watching yourself back is extremely necessary to see, like if something looks awkward when you're trying to execute a particular technique, um, you could say like, oh, okay, there's something going on there when Mm -hmm. I like go from one string to the next on an upstroke or downstroke or whatever. Maybe there's something with my pick slanting that's tripping me up right there. Um, And sometimes it reveals itself pretty clearly in the audio. Um, Sometimes it's just like, oh, I just botched that transfer from one string to the next. So let's like figure out how to make that smooth. Um, But it's just, it's all about analyzing the details in a, in a rather granular way. Um, And then just, I get, I very easily get tunnel vision personally. So I, uh, I'll just get obsessed with that. I'll fixate on a small detail and just work on it until it's kind of where I want it. It's never totally where you want anything, you know? Um, it never will be. Exactly. So you have to make your peace with that fact as well. It's, it's all a very weird balancing act of like being focused and more sometimes even fixated and then also learning to let go at a certain point and moving on. Um, did that sort of answer? Yeah, totally. It, okay. I've noticed when working on something that I get tunnel visioned on that um, there comes a point where my brain is basically full. Like, like playing starts to go and it's not even just with playing. It can be with anything. But, um, you know, like whatever it is that I'm doing will just – it was start to reach this point of diminishing returns where my brain is no longer, it's no longer engaged. My willpower is engaged, but my, that part of the part of the brain that is actually helping you improve is just gone. And then it's not like I'm playing it well enough to just repeat it and build muscle memory and playing it like shit. And then, um, I feel like when I get to that point after I've done a bunch of work, uh, like I feel, I have this feeling of being, done for now. And I'm good with that, like on a day-to-day basis. Um, doesn't it, sometimes it takes a long time to translate into feeling good about the the thing itself. I mean, it could take months, but I try to look at it on a day-to-day level where do I, in that session, did I get to that point where I maxed out the brain and, uh, and have to move on to something else? Yeah, man, I totally know what you're saying. There is this point of this, like this fullness that you reach. Like you said, I really like that description. And there's, that's just the nature of the learning process, right? You can only shoehorn in so much information in a given period of time. And then you have to just let it 
marinate and let all of that information sort of congeal with everything else in your brain. And, uh, and that, that process of leaving it alone for a while is really where the benefits are start or they start to be able to be reaped, so to speak. Right. That time Um, off could be five minutes. It could be a day. It could be two weeks. Like that's the interesting part is I feel like I don't know how long that gap needs to be until I have been in the gap basically. Absolutely. It's, it's something that you start to tap into over time. You, you develop this intuition of like, I'm not ready to revisit that yet. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's all experiential and you, everybody, it's so highly personalized and you just have to feel it out as you go. And that's just why anything takes so many years. Any, any expertise takes not that I have any expertise, but you know, uh, any expertise take, well, thank you. That's, that's very nice of you to say it all goes, I'll probably say some self-deprecating <laughs> stuff every now and then and we'll it's, just have to let it go. It's, it's uh, a, it's, you know, <laughs> back to what we were first talking about. I think it's a good thing to be self-deprecating. It, yeah. Do you ever reach this point where something gives out before something else? Like your arms give out before your brain or your brain gives out before your arms. You kind of got to reconcile the two. Absolutely, man. Um, I've been dealing with some tendonitis lately, too, which sucks. Yeah. And it's like in the middle of some like probably the busiest time ever for me. And that's probably what created this issue in the first place is just needing to practice so much for so many various projects. Um, So, yeah, right. As of now, lately, it's been my arm giving out this this nice little tendon right there is like, nah, we're going to take a break. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have fun. Um, So yeah, my brain. uh, Well, so I've been learning a lot of uh, this band called Arch Echo, which I'm sure, yeah, I know you're familiar with them. Yeah. We have them on Nail the Mix and stuff. And yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. So I'm filling in for Adam Bentley of Mm -hmm. that band on their next tour. And uh, just, they feel that music fills my brain real quick. That one's, oh, I can see that. It's, yeah. It's a lot to shove in there. It's, it's much more mental than it is physical in a lot of ways. So it just depends on the, the material, I guess. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if it's muscle memory based stuff or technical, technically challenging stuff, of course the hand's going to give out first. Um, but with, with, Prague and Prague fusion metal, whatever you want to call it, especially the, my, my dumb, my dumb guy brain gives out real quick. So the arch echo <laughs> stuff, um, I, the, I have that impression because I mean, it is difficult stuff, but it's not like, you know, it's not like arc spire or something. Um, it's not at 300 BPM, but I mean, it's definitely fast, but I feel like it's more of a, it's more just complicated. Uh, it's more just complicated. So, uh, how do you go about learning that? Like, and act, actually learning it to where you're comfortable getting on stage. Like, what's the process there? Yeah, uh, we're figuring that out as we go. Yeah. Um, work in progress. It's a, it's a work in, yeah, literally. It's like three weeks to the first show or something like that. And, I'm like, Ooh, we got some work to do still. Uh, so yeah, I think I underestimated the difficulty because of exactly what you just touched on yourself. It doesn't sound that hard it's to deceptive. play. So deceptive, man. I was like, I could, I play the rhythm. I could fucking do that. You know, like, and that's, there's like this weird thing in my head that I've also observed about myself where I'm cocky at times and then very self-deprecating at times. And it's like one or the other kind of, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and so I listened to that stuff. I was like, I could do that. And then uh, I go to learn it. I'm like, wow, this is just so much memorization, so much counting, so many like key center changes, so many modulations, metric and harmonic um, that it's, it's tough to be accurate and to be precise with your hands when your mind is uncertain of what needs to be done. Yeah. So it's so much uh, a mental process trying to learn that stuff. And it is, it, it's deceptively difficult. And uh, maybe that's, yeah, I feel like they probably, 
people probably listen to that music and they're like, I'm sure some people rightly assess the difficulty of it, but I'm sure it goes even over a lot of people's heads. Gar- you know? Guaranteed. Um, the ex-concert master of the Atlanta Symphony, she was a uh, phenomenal, phenomenal violinist. And I remember talking to her once about, uh, you know, memorizing like, Sibelius Violin Concerto, which is crazy. Um, is really, really crazy. And she said that basically she sees it in two ways. One is actually playing it. Like, can I actually play this? And the other is, do I understand it? And so she plays it in her mind uh, as part of a practice routine. Like say she would spend six hours a day on it. One of those hours is running whatever piece she's doing twice in her head. And um, she she uses that as a guide of what to practice on the instrument. Like if she knows if she fucks up in her head, then she's got to go actually practice that. But she said that once you can actually play it through start to finish in your head, then the, the physical part is not that it's easy, but it's like you've removed unnecessary barriers. Absolutely. I actually do the same thing. That's a method that I switch to like midway through this process of learning this material Um, because my hands were giving out. What I would do is I would just take the music uh, and just like go to the gym and go on like the Stairmaster or the treadmill for like two hours and just listen to the whole set. And then I would be like, okay, if I can predict what's coming and if I can visualize uh, what's going on on guitar as I'm listening to it, then I know it. Um, And yeah, I, I remember hearing about or reading a, a study like years and years ago that uh, they even did this with piano players. They saw that even just thinking about practicing the material showed some gains in their ability to play it. Um, so I, I again, this was like years ago that I remember reading this, but it stuck with me in my brain. I was like, okay, so if I actually just think about it, there is something happening in my brain that is allowing me to be able to execute this better in the physical reality. So, um, so there's absolute truth to that, that I've noticed and perhaps even empirically, but like subjectively, I felt that to be true as well. Um, that thinking about it truly does help. And, um, yeah. So if you don't, if you can't audiate it, right. Or like, which is just visualizing in the auditory form, I guess, um, you don't really know it that well. And I'm the sort of person who really likes to be extremely comfortable with something before I perform it. I like to really know it in and out and be extremely confident. Um, that's the only way I don't have like anxiety before I get on stage is if I'm like, I got this. Um, so, so yeah, that process has been an invaluable one. So when you're, uh, on the treadmill, listening to the music and visualizing it or trying to predict what's coming next, are you visualizing a fretboard at the same time? Sometimes, uh, I've noticed that I, I tend to like, I think I was born to be a drummer. I do tend to like hear it rhythmically. Yeah. I, I was drawn to drums. I think more, I don't know. I'm like a guitarist who wishes they were a bunch of other things. Um, but (laughs) yeah, I, uh, I actually picture a lot of it, like the kick drum patterns because the stuff that I'm learning, I'm learning the rhythm parts. Um, so a lot of it matches with the kick pattern. So I'll just visualize the kick the actual kick drum and that like the actual, me. not like a piano roll, but like actual kick drum. Yeah. Right. Even mm-hmm. though, because I only program drums now, I, uh, sometimes that thought does pop into my head, like visualize the grid on the piano and the piano roll and all that. But, um, that does, that does help me just visualizing like kick patterns for those sorts of rhythms and things like that. And then for, I'll, I'll have to force myself to think about the fretboard if I actually want to visualize it. It doesn't, I don't naturally think about the fretboard, if that makes sense. It does. That's uh, that's fascinating because I know that whenever uh, I was learning to read music or even learning tabs or doing that, you know, mental learning side of things, 
uh, thinking about, you know, thinking about a part I'm writing, uh, when I'm not actually sitting there writing it, uh, there's always a fretboard. There, that's just how, even when I'm listening to stuff that's not on guitar, like there's a fretboard shows up. It's weird. Yeah, you're probably like a real guitar player. I don't know about <laughs> that, but uh, but definitely hide behind a fretboard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't understand how people do it without a frame of reference like that. That's it's really fascinating to me. So you're here, you're visualizing a kick drum, but you're still hearing pitches. Yeah, yeah, I am, and I think of it. It's more like directional, so it's almost. I don't know what I visualize now that I, you got me thinking about this now. I'm like, what do I even think about? Um, but I, it's more like just directional, like the melodic arc Mm -hmm. of something that you would see written out on the staff or something. Um, so I know it goes up and because I have like an okay sense of relative pitch, I'll be like, Oh, it goes to the four and five, whatever. Um, so I'll be like, Okay, I think, and then I'll have to translate that to the fretboard. So, okay, we're in the key, we're in C minor. So that would be there. That would have to be there. The I'll like retroactively put it on the fretboard in my brain, but I just see it moving up and down in terms of like the harmonic and melodic arc of it. I don't know. You Maybe started, that doesn't make sense. No, it makes <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense in that uh, I'm sh- me trying to imagine how you see it obviously is not going to be accurate because that's your own uh your own patented method but um <laughs> it, you know kind of like trying to describe a dream to somebody like no matter no matter what they're not gonna actually get it but i understand you see you have a visual representation of a melodic contour that's going in time with imagining the kick it like it makes sense and you've identified that that's that's how your brain takes this stuff in. But what I'm curious about is you started playing guitar super young, like at seven, right? So was that your first instrument? It was actually, yeah. So where's Um, that kick drum coming from? (laughs) I just really liked drums as a kid too. Um, Despite my parents' best efforts to not let me have a drum kit in the house, I still got one. Um, Uh, And I I just really liked playing drums for fun. I never took it super seriously and I don't like practice or anything, but I just, I really love, uh, playing drums. And now I just, like I said, I just program them. So I'm like, a like very much, a I don't know, just a wannabe drummer. <laughs> but, um, but, but okay. So, but it's coming from actual experience on the kit that sure experience. We'll use that term loosely. Oh. Uh, it's all just, all very much recreational. Yeah, um, it doesn't have but, to be professional. It, sure. Just yeah, fucking yeah. around. Exactly. That's all it ever was. And I just, I don't know. It, there's something very visceral about drums that I, I get from that instrument and I don't get from any other instrument. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like a more primal sort of like getting in touch with, yeah, the more primal side of how you experience music. That's what drums represent to me. And uh, I think that's why when I just straight up listen to music, that's how I feel it. Like, that's how I truly internalize it is rhythmically. Um, and and then guitar just allows the other elements of expression to come into play, which um, they're not afterthoughts by any means. Uh, but that tends to be what hits me first is the rhythm. If maybe that sort of gives a better idea of what I'm why my brain works that way. Yeah, uh-huh. it, it does. And uh, I've always thought that, um, well, drummers who play guitar are always better. Uh, and also guitar players that play drums always, they always have an advantage, I feel like. It's because guitar players who don't, I mean, there's a lot of great ones, but there's all kinds of guitar player tendencies uh, that to do stuff that's not in time or that it's weirdly in time. Weird feel is very uh, common among guitar players, but I've noticed the ones who have taken the time to learn drums or learn bass tend to just have better feel overall. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely observed that as well. There's something about just broadening 
the the scope of like the lens through which you, you view things. If you have more lenses, it just broadens your perspective and your ability to interpret things, not through this very sort of myopic frame. Um, so it just gives you more wherewithal, I feel, musically. You understand what the role of the other instruments are mm-hmm. and the purpose they serve. And you understand how your instrument feeds into that and can lock in with that. So it's, I always, I actually encouraged a lot of my students for a while, especially the ones who struggled with rhythm. I was like, dude, just like get some drumsticks and a practice pad and feel rhythm, Mm -hmm. not like a guitar player, because there's something about that instrument where it almost, for me at least, it, it doesn't encourage you to feel things super rhythmically unless you're like strumming. Right. Yeah. But if you're doing if you're just interested in like shred, do people who like only ever wanted to learn how to shred their timing sucks. Oh, yeah. Like, horrific. <laughs> yeah. And so you have to like you have to learn funk. You have to like learn your strumming patterns first and foremost um, and then sort of like narrow down your range of motion with your picking hand as you progress. Like, I feel like if you start with the very fine motions, you're not like tapping into that like primal side of your musical brain. And so your timing is going to therefore suffer. These are all just theories I have. This is, uh, this is not science, but this is what I think. Um, Maybe that makes sense. Well, it's not (laughs) science. It's definitely art that's uh it, it what's cool about music is that it's both i think it's like both art and but also there's this craft side which um which can get pretty scientific and uh i think that science just hasn't figured out uh how to explain the creative part but i think it will one day but completely agree with that yeah but there's these tendencies i don't think that I don't think that we're just imagining this. I mean, I've I've seen and encountered a lot of musicians at this point and uh, have recorded a lot of guitar players. And, you know, we have the representation of the waveform against time, like right there. So it's not even, it's not a subjective thing. Like I've recorded enough guitar players to just spot the tendencies over the years. And though, yeah. and what you just said, actually, the guitar players who I have uh, recorded and known who have the best feel out of anybody, they all know how to play funk with without without fail. Interesting. Yeah. No, I that's something that I'm I'm very fortunate to have had an incredible guitar teacher when I was a kid. I took lessons with him. I was probably his longest student ever. I took lessons with him for like nine years and wow. it, I just took yeah, I like maybe it wasn't maybe it was like seven years. So that's a long so, time. Yeah, absolutely. He had to tell me to leave. He was like, I got nothing left. Dude. Tapped him leave. out. Yeah. <laughs> and uh so it, but I remember when I was uh he, he is like a very well rounded player. Um and he had me learn a lot of funk when I was a kid. Uh he was like, You need to get your muting. Like he just he mm-hmm. laid out all the reasons why I needed to learn some funk riffs. And I was like, absolutely, dude, whatever you say. And uh, so I just remember like getting that technique down and and really like working on the right hand and the timing. And then, of course, the muting with the left. And um, it, it definitely it helped me in ways that I didn't realize or couldn't fully appreciate when I was younger. Um, but it is something that I think about now. And it's it's cool to hear that corroborated all of my. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so that's awesome. For those reasons that you just mentioned as well, because of the ability to mute um, and then knowing how to basically insert silence in the middle of a passage where there's a lot of action happening from the strumming hand or from picking hand, there's a there's a parallel right there to metal for sure. Even though it's a different motion, it sounds completely different. Being able to mute properly and uh, have gaps in the right spots in the middle of like very fast 
passages. Uh, I mean, it's a, there's a direct parallel right there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's something about metal players who did not start with playing metal that gives like so much dimension to their playing and their ability to utilize silence, especially like you said, that's a huge element that it just goes very overlooked in our genre, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, yeah. But uh, I totally agree with what you said about the contrast between what needs to happen with the left and the right and building or developing that autonomy between the two hands. That's something that's very important to learn very early on. I Do think. you work on that now or is it kind of, is that like kind of just like in the DNA at this point? I think it's, it's not even in there as much as I would like it to be. So perhaps I should work on it more. Um, it's just, I'm so, there's so much to do that some things yeah. tend to fall by the wayside. It's just like anything else in life. It's like, yeah, you have this whole list of things that you want to do and work on and improve on, but it's like, we got to prioritize some things over others. Um, so maybe I will revisit that at some point. Um, I could, I always like to make things stronger. I wouldn't say it's like fully um, baked into my DNA as much as I would like, but mm-hmm. uh, luckily I learned it. I learned that technique early on enough to where it suffices that uh, gets me through some situations. Um, but I don't, I just, you don't ever use it in our genre to its full extent. You'll use no. maybe like elements of the technique, but um, it's not like full, you're not, unless you're Arch Echo actually, that I actually had to uh, do like a couple of funk parts for a couple of the songs. There's like some funk strumming patterns. So I had to revisit it there, which was fun. I was like, Oh man, I haven't done this in forever. It's, it's super cool. So I revisited it for that purpose. Uh, but other than that, there's like not much opportunity. No, it's, it's one of those things where the, the benefit is not direct, but it's very real. Like ear training. Yeah, it, yeah absolutely. I think there's just so many parallels in life to that what you just said whoops that there's uh, a non non-direct benefit that's still totally real absolutely yeah. everything yeah yeah you just you want to be well-rounded um you want to have as many raw materials aggregated as you can and as many tools as you can um because that will ultimately create a more unique output, right? You, you you don't want to just sound like, maybe you do, maybe, you do, I don't know what I'm saying. Maybe you do want to just sound like straight up metal. Um, I guess I'm, I'm very biased when I say these things. But I think even if you know that that's, that you have that singular focus, um, there are lots of metal bands that don't, they don't bring in, or at least not on the surface, them bring in other genres on the surface, but they're still killer musicians, and what they do with the music is still outlandish and uh, and nuts. and And it's because they're not just covering, you know, the big metal songs, and that's all they do. Like, um, I, I think it's possible to have a singular focus, but also have your own voice. Um, but it it takes it takes a uh, it takes thought uh, for sure. I'm curious yeah. though now. So now that you're at this stage where you do have a lot going on, um, you know, there's obviously having to keep up with your playing. There's your own music. There's gigs for other people. There's all this stuff. So how do you prioritize on a day-to-day level to where I, I realize you'll never get everything done ever, but just so that, how do you prioritize in a way that, uh, keeps you from going nuts and keeps you moving forward? Mm, Well, keeps me from going nuts. We'll see if (laughs) I can manage that. Uh, but I think, uh, I, I am in like sort of uncharted territory at this very moment in terms of the workload and the various types of work that I have right now. Uh, which I'm not complaining about whatsoever. I'm very grateful for all the things 
I'd rather be extremely busy in pulling my hair out than just like oh, yeah. pour it out of my mind. Good problems. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I had to, I mean, there have been a couple moments where I like mentally take stock of all the things that I have to do. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> and there have been like a few moments where I'm, I, I have like a, like a momentary freak out. And I'm like, okay, I have a whiteboard. I'm just going to write out all the things on the whiteboard. Uh, and then just see what I can do in a day, plot it all out. Um, but as far as prioritizing goes, that's been a really tricky thing. Something that I've been, I'm t- like, even yesterday, I was like, what should I be prioritizing right now? Because I have, I think I have very ambitious goals. Um, and I want to do a lot and I want to maximize my time. And I also work like, I feel like I do nothing but work. And, but that the term work encompasses like writing, practicing, um, you know, whatever teaching, even gear demos, social media, uh, practicing, touring material, all that stuff, uh, editing videos, whatever. Um, I feel like I do nothing but those things. And sometimes I get, tunnel vision, um, on one particular thing at a time. And I do like to spend a lot of time on everything because I like to perfect things. Um, I want to see the vision that I have all the way through. And sometimes it takes a long time. And that is something that I'll probably need to visit, uh, revisit and ask myself like, okay, are there diminishing returns here? Um, should I be investing all this time? Is this good enough? Um, should I just put this out? Um, should I spend more time on it? Uh, and then there are things that are time sensitive. Like I have tours coming up. I have a lot of material to learn. Um, so those things should be prioritized. As you can see, it's all a work in progress right now. Oh, totally. So when you're in that moment of, uh, what should I be doing, uh, well, how do you then decide, okay, I'm going to do this now? I think it's just mental illness. Like, I think I just <laughs> sort of like... Kind of a prerequisite for being good at music. I, Dude, you're telling me. I think it's just like, I get fixated on something. I'm like, I really want to do this right now. And I just sort of listen to my intuition, which I think lacks discipline in a lot of ways. So... I think I am going to have to change my approach. Um, I could get away with that in the past because I had more time to dedicate mm-hmm. to like working on a project for, you know, days at a time, but now I just don't have the time to do that. So I have to put on my, like, I have to self parent myself now and say, okay, nope, this is too much time, uh, that I'm spending on this. I need to move on to the next thing. Um, so the regulation process is one that I feel in this industry, there's never going to be a moment or times in your life. If you're, if you are very ambitious where you don't have a lot going on. Never. Um, yeah. So, so I think, um, my, my regulation process and my ability to tell myself, okay, I'm reaching the point of diminishing returns here. Um, that, that intuition needs to be leveled up a bit. So I'm, you're just, you're talking, maybe next year I'll have this more figured out or something, but at this very moment, uh, I'm, I'm still sort of, like I said, titrating and, and figuring, I don't know. Do you have any advice? <laughs> um, well, I understand exactly what you're saying. Cause, uh, the, I kind of do the same thing where I just go down rabbit holes and most of the great things in my life are uh, that I'm really thankful for are because of that, of because of my lack of discipline and because of my ADD. Um, because you know, even though um, it fucks up certain parts of my life, it's made these other things very possible. Like when I want something, like when I really want something, like I my brain just locks in on it and uh manifests it through a lot of work and um 
like nonstop thought, like literally nonstop. Uh, I have, I kind of um, made a point of putting a few boundaries up to where, uh, like for instance, with um, my girlfriend, I kind of just made the decision at the beginning of our relationship that uh, I would tell, I would make myself just stop when we're hanging out. And uh, like, so when we are together, like, except for a very, very, very close to a deadline or something like that, um, maybe, except for like at the peak of a project, like Doth just finished an album. So, you know, those last few weeks, uh, I was definitely not into hanging out. But it, on a general, general basis is I've made myself stop um, in order to be present for things outside of the, you know, the thing that drives me the most, um, because I, I've lived enough to see what happens when you don't do that. Um, it like, it's, it can be very destructive. So over, over time. And what I noticed is that by doing that, by putting a few, it's not that many limits. It's not like, it's not like we're hanging out all day, every day or anything. It's, uh, you know, there's a time at night and it's, uh, not even every night, but like just having those boundaries has helped me put up boundaries in other areas because I know I need to get this done by this point in time. And even though I have imposed these boundaries on myself, it's helped that a lot. Um, so I feel like trying to make myself think differently doesn't work. So I can't change that. So, but what I can do is I can set up my life to where I have no choice uh, to, but to uh, do things a little bit differently. So, yeah, I feel like it's more of about engineering your life rather than trying to engineer your brain. Um, if you, because it's uh, how you are. I mean, yeah, people can change, but uh, not that much. Yeah. You, yeah. you kind of are who you are. Absolutely. That's a proclivity to obsess over things. If you have that, you're not going to get rid of that. In fact, you just have to channel that. But I do like that very actionable advice of just putting up those sort of guardrails um, in terms of the time allotment, right? Uh, and if you have a set period of time where it's like, I need to hang out with my girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Um, I need to, that's why just having actual relationships in your life yeah. is really great. And it's so, it's so hard to manage. Cause it's like, you want to find that balance where you're not totally socially isolated, but also this sort of lifestyle, uh, is extremely demanding of your time. Well, you got to prioritize um, those as well. I've noticed is social relationships, just like the work they need to be prioritized. So I don't hang out with people that much. Like, um, Same. yeah, it, it, it's like, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, there's no way. I, I don't understand how people exist in LA. Like, how yeah. are they doing that? How are they hanging out every single night with people and also getting work done? I ask myself that all the time. I'm like, I must be doing something wrong. I just, I, it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. Um, yeah, I guess some people just like don't sleep, but I also still don't really sleep. So I don't, uh, dude, I don't know. Maybe they just take like copious amounts of Adderall or something. And May, just, maybe. Oh, uh, well, are you an introvert <laughs> or an extrovert? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, for sure. I was like born an introvert. I, oh my God, the social anxiety when I was a kid was insane. Um, but I sort of like forced myself to learn how to enjoy socials. I sound like a robot, dude. Um, but I, no, I did. Like, I uh, get it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I did like, I put myself in situations that I was not necessarily naturally comfortable in. Um, and I was just, a. I taught guitar for a long time and had some jobs that required me to be like interact with people nonstop and just be sort of like the life of the party. And, um, that was extremely uncomfortable for me. Terrible. But then I, 
Yeah, it was. But it was good for me. It was very good for me. But uh, naturally, I will just sit like at my desk all day, every day and just, you know, hang out with like one person and my dog uh, for the rest of my life if it, if I don't like make an effort to go do other things. Um, so I guess naturally I'm pretty introverted. I still need time away from people to recharge. I don't charge myself from some, some social interactions. I feel like pepped up afterwards and whatnot, but I think for the most part, I'm like, let me go home. (laughs) Yeah. See, I think that's a blessing for this type of work because, um, if you're, if you're drawn to, being by yourself and just doing stuff by yourself and you're comfortable being by yourself, you'll put more time into this. And I think it's a blessing. That's something that I've thought. I actually think I have that thought, like every time I hear an insane player, like an insane shredder or something, I'm like, that person loves to be alone. Yep. Uh, Cause clearly they sat in their bedroom for hours and hours and like they didn't go like hang out and go drinking all night. And, you know, they just sat there and paid close attention to detail. So I think about the, the sort of person it takes just when I hear like a few notes that they play and like that person has sat on their own and introspected a lot, you know? Yeah. They, you can't get there without putting in an enormous amount of time And, uh, I think also as I get older, um, and I've had friends who kind of echo this is, uh, you know, the kinds of things that were exciting when you're 15 or when you're 20, when you're 25, like it's constantly changing, but there's, uh, there are things that when you're a lot younger, uh, they're happening for the first time because you're no longer a kid. And so that in and of itself is exciting. But once like that wears off and it's just normal life, well, those things no longer uh, excite you the way that they used to. And it's a lot easier to, uh, to just focus. Um, I think the problem is when people stay in the, uh, stay in, in that mode, like they get into a mode as soon as they're out of high school or something. And then it just doesn't, they don't stop with the, with being into the things that someone is naturally into when they're 18, like going out, uh, going to bars, like not that there's anything wrong with going to bars, but there's like, uh, there's this, uh, thing about, I feel like when you're a lot younger where it's, uh, just hanging out with people in and of itself, there's like some value to that. And, uh, the older I get, the less value I see in it because, I could be doing something else that actually provides uh, value to my life. Absolutely. And I have that thought all the time. And then I wonder what's wrong with me. Um, Cause I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's, it's all kind of luck of the draw with how you're wired, I guess mm-hmm. too. Cause if you are wired that way to seek more fulfillment through creating things or doing things or, um, yeah, being like actually producing, um, material assets into the world in the form of music or whatever it might be, then that's great. You're going to be a very productive human. And I've also met like some people who just get their fulfillment from relationships and, and forging those. And it's not wild. um, Yeah, dude. I, I mean, I get it, I guess. I, but like, there's something about the way people like you and I are wired where it forces us back down this path. Like, it's almost like this deterministic thing where we are meant to do this, they are meant to do that. And of course, it's not like binary and black and white, but, um, but, and there's this whole spectrum of people who get satisfaction from a little bit of this and a little bit of that and some, some combinatory. Uh, thing there but um yeah it's it's just interesting how like your reward systems and your maybe even like physiology your biology is like making you pursue a certain thing um maybe that's something that people like us have in common 
is that I think so. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. So I think if uh, if I was a total extrovert, or just say a total extrovert, um, maybe maybe being a vocalist would be a better idea for sure. because like so I think that it's uh you're lucky if your personality type and those isms match with what's required for what you want to do in life. Um, so, you know, if you're energized by being alone and just focusing, you also want to be a great guitar player. Well, those two things kind of go together. So that's fortunate. But if you want to be a great guitar player and you also seek a lot of social validation, I'm not saying you can't make it work. It's just a little bit harder because you're going to be drawn to leaving the house more. And that, pr that probably relates to like the sort of genre that people choose. Cause like if you're just playing power chords and you just need to like dress all cool and shit and then get on stage and like play some easy stuff and you're extroverted and yep. you just want to hang, like you just join like a party band or whatever, where, you know, not a lot is technically demanded of you. Um, which honestly, Maybe it would be better to be away. Oh, yeah. Way. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, who who actually cares about, like, how technical? I don't know. Maybe I'm just, only like, people that uh, Only people that are trying to play guitar. Ex right. So it's like, we're just screwed, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But it's pointless in trying to fight it, I, I've noticed. Um at least for me, I've and I've tried a few different times throughout my life to uh, to be more normal. It just doesn't it doesn't work. Yeah, um, I had a, I, a therapist when I was like twenty or something who uh, was trying to break me out of that. Or just like just accept it, just accept who you are and that you're not normal, and it's okay. Like you've got a lot of power in uh, your brain has a lot of power and. Uh, just uh just lean into it um yeah which you know i think when i'm younger and thinking back to younger years uh socializing was more important so uh even though i was an introvert like because you're at school all the time and because you're at college or something and you're surrounded by people it seems like that matters a lot more um and then if you uh, if you don't know how to relate to those people, then it's like fuck, what's wrong with me? But uh, I I've learned over the years that it's kind of pointless to worry about it too much because really not going to change that. Yeah, you're way uh, fighting an uphill battle or s swimming way against the current there, and yeah. it's just going to tire you out. And it's like you could just be going with the flow and just getting way farther along. And, uh, yeah, it, there's something about just turning your brain off. It's that, it's that same mechanism that makes us self-critical probably that makes us think about like whether or not we're doing the correct thing by giving into our, um, our instincts or our proclivities. Um, and then that also just wastes time. <laughs> it, uh, there, there, it wastes time, but like, there is a benefit to asking yourself those questions. Um, you know, if you're writing music or making videos or whatever, whatever it is, podcasts, what putting stuff out and it's meant to go into the world and be consumed by people and you want to um, make a career out of any of those things. Well, you got to put some thought into who's going to be on the other end of it. I mean, I, I feel like, yeah, it's like this romantic idea that you can just do everything in a bubble where, and, but like, and we all probably know of a few artists who have pulled that off, but uh, you do, I mean, you can't just show up hundred percent as uh, like, as your tendency would have you for everything. You got to make some effort, but I think knowing where it matters is, is key. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, I guess, quite a few purists who would take that mindset. And yeah, like you said, it's probably luck that they're able to just do the thing that they want to do and they get great success out of that. But yeah, um, to be 
su- successful in this climate, you do have have to be analyzing, you know, what people want. Like take the temperature quite frequently and sort of modify your your behavior to some extent and what you put out there. And yeah, that part of your brain certainly assists in being like very analytical, perceptive, and then you're able to mold what it is that you're doing more effectively and get a little further along perhaps than somebody who isn't uh, adjusting their behavior or what they're putting out into the world. Um, But yeah, I think, I think today, especially it's just such a saturated market and so it's so competitive for everyone's vying for everyone's attention and uh you you got to be on the ball with that stuff and you have to be very perceptive yeah i mean you know there are some people who just are naturally in tune with uh with exactly where the masses are and so they don't have to modify anything um but i don't think that it requires change like I just want to be clear for people listening. I'm not saying you have to change your personality or anything like that. It's just like you take parts of yourself that, um, that are applicable for whatever it is and turn them up. And then the parts of yourself that, uh, that are getting in the way, you turn those down, but it's still you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's a much better way of putting it. Cause I guess what I said could definitely have been interpreted as yeah just you know be a complete character and not like a real version of yourself in any way um because that's just what people want no yeah of course you're gonna have to if it's gonna be sustainable in any way you have to show your authentic self but yeah dial it up in the ways that are fun for people and and you know cool it down with the ways that aren't uh but yeah so i i'm curious speaking of putting yourself out there Um, as a guitar player, um, is that something that, uh, happened? Like, did you naturally fall into, uh, knowing that you had to make video and like knowing what types of videos work or is this something where, um, you know, you, you kind of just knew you wanted to get out there as a guitar player and analyze that this is probably a, a good path. I guess it did naturally happen. Um, and this is not like the future that I envisioned for myself when I was younger or anything. What was, any what's the future you envisioned? Uh, just, you know, the basic, uh, the basic dream, which is like, uh, be in a band and tour and everyone's going to love your music. And, uh, and you, mm-hmm. some record label is going to be like, here's $250,000. Have fun, kid. You know, whatever. Uh, take some time, write some music. And <laughs> then it, it just turned into like, oh, that's never going to happen. So, and I like very specific music and band members are hard to find. And so it turned into like a solo project and it turned into like, a, I guess I'm just going to, uh, post on social media because that's where I'm seeing some sort of, uh, reward, I guess. Um, and at first I was, I didn't, I don't even know how I started with the whole like video stuff, especially on Instagram, because I was just writing licks all the time. And, uh, I would just post a couple here and there and the videos seemed to do, relatively well. I mean, I had like, I had no, I was just a nobody. It's just like a, you know, local musician in some, you know, in Orlando, Florida, like I wasn't anything. And, uh, people would like, I remember like just videos would get what I thought were an inordinate amount of views. And I was like, maybe I should just keep doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it turned into, okay, I have, this is the viable route for me to have a career in music. Um, so it, it, everything just sort of snowballed from there and naturally progressed into what it is. Um, so I never thought like I want to, Instagram was barely a thing. It became a thing in what, like 2011, 
or something? Like, I think it it came into existence then, but I feel like around 2013-ish is when it people started to really adopt it. Yes, that's uh, 2013 was the year that stood out to me as far as like when I started actually using it. Um, so that must have been like right when I got, I left college. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I don't know, I wasn't seeing anything anywhere else. So I was like, I'm just going to, I'll just do this, I guess. That's fine. That's so Um, key though. Uh, so right there, um, I just want to focus on that for a second. Uh, I have seen so many people mess up their careers or their potential careers by not uh, following opportunities as they presented themselves because the opportunities that presented themselves were not in the way that they had imagined Uh, as opposed to just seeing it, seeing the opportunities for what they are and just going down the path that seemed the best and then, you know, correcting course when needed. But I've seen so many people mess up because of that. I'm not going to lie. I kind of was that for, I, I went back and forth. I had these phases and you can even see when I went through these phases, if you look at the dates of my posts on Instagram, because I took like nine months off at one point, Mm -hmm. it's, it's miraculous that I have a career quite honestly, because I just like, I didn't capitalize on opportunities when they did present. If I had gone harder at the times where I was like, fuck the system, you know, <laughs> then I, uh, I would be much further along quite honestly. And so what you're saying is absolutely true. Um, and part of me wishes that I had gone harder in those moments where I backed off, but then part of me is like, that's just how my life was meant to go. I needed that experience of, you know, uh, tapping into my, like, I guess, uh, altruistic side or something, or it's good to know what social media is and to really understand the benefits and the costs of it. Um, so if you never go through that phase where you're seeing the potential problems and like rightly assessing, uh, the, the harm that it can kind of cause to your psyche, Mm -hmm. um, then I think that's, you're not, you're also not setting yourself up for sustainable success either. Um, so I think detaching myself from that world and not finding my identity becoming so, uh, wrapped up in this thing of like Instagram or YouTube or whatever, um, whatever social media platform it is, I think it's it's important to separate yourself from that at some point and realize like, okay, my whole life isn't this. I have other things. And uh, so if that, if that, you know, those nice little graphs start to dip in your analytics every now and then, you're not wanting to like die. Um, yeah. So I don't, it, the, it's so tough to like dole out advice for like this blanket advice of like, yeah, just go all in on social media, just, which I do think is the right move. You're totally right. Like you have to take at this point in in 20, you don't have a choice. Like you're going to get left in the dust. I'm extremely lucky that I didn't get left in the dust when I took those breaks that I took. Um, so the, you just have to, unfortunately you have to take it. You can reflect quietly at night. Um, but uh, you know, it is what it is. Like there's shitty aspects to any job. Um, and getting to do music as a job is fucking awesome, but it's not like every single aspect of it is great. But I mean, I feel like if that's what you have to do, it's not that bad. Oh, I, and that's what I ultimately came to as far as the conclusion goes. Um, I I was like, you know what, this is what being a musician in this decade Mm -hmm. is. You, you have to, 
This is where all the attention is. This is where people get their value from your work um, or where people derive value from your work, I should say. Uh, And there's that old thing that I was describing earlier of like, take your time to write an album and like, you know, then people will show up to your shows and it'll be a great, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't, maybe for some people who are extremely lucky, but like total like lottery stuff. mm -hmm. If you're, if you want to Mm -hmm. actually work and like have a more secure future, you, you just have to put in the hours and be on social media and like interact with companies, interact with your fans and your followers. And which is honestly, it's not that bad. Like it's, it's awesome. When, like you said, it's a really, it's a really cool job. You just can't let it consume you in the ways that it, it unfortunately uh, can <laughs> uh, if you're not careful. So. Well, yeah, I mean, the social media is, it, I think it depends on the how you define yourself, right? Like, what's your identity? Is your identity a social media influencer? Is your identity an artist, musician who uses social media as a tool? Those are two very different things. Yes, it is. It, and, but those lines get so blurred they can. nowadays. It, it can, yeah, yeah. Um, knowing, knowing your identity is is extremely important and knowing what your I hate using this term but knowing what your brand is is also uh, it sounds like such a hacky thing to say but well, you true. do have yeah it is unfortunately um but yeah I think a lot of people want one thing and uh, don't know how to establish themselves as such like um even me like I'm all over the place right now quite honestly and uh I I need to take stock again of where I'm at. How so? and say like, what do you mean? Um, well, of course I want to be like, I, I would like to do more with my solo project, um, which I have been putting in a lot of work into doing that, like writing new music. Which is that sick, I, by the way. Oh, thanks man. Um, I appreciate that a lot. I'm, I'm really happy with the new stuff that I haven't, released yet. I've been working on that for some time now. And, um, I do think it's quite a few steps up from the last thing. Uh, so I would, I would love to focus on being a solo artist, which is weird to say, cause I always wanted to do the band thing, but here we are. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, am I going to grow my YouTube channel now? Am I going to go, Um, am I going to continue to do this Instagram thing the way that I've been doing it, where I'm seeing some results? Um, am I going to, I have a couple bands that I'm doing some tours with. Uh, am I going to be a fill in player? Am I going to be a session player? Am I going to, you know, try to get some, you know, get in with a bigger band? Am I, you know, all of these things require a lot of time. So I'm throwing a lot of things at the wall at this very moment. Maybe, maybe this is a little, is this boring? Too no, much no, inside no. Baseball? It's a, I was <laughs> thinking was the, I mean, isn't that kind of like the same thing as what we were just saying of like paying attention to where the opportunity is or the success is coming from and then doubling down. And I feel like, I feel like if you stop doing that, your career will stagnate. So it doesn't matter how deep in you are, I feel like there's, you got to constantly be evaluating these things and there will always be time periods where you have like six different things, six different paths you could go down and any one of them could be a career in and of itself. Um, And probably some blend of all of them is what you're going to end up doing, but like how to prioritize which one Uh, it's a tough, it's a tough question, but I think it's really, really relevant because it's the same thing as what you were saying before about what well, you're noticing Instagram 10 years ago was getting results, like viable results, like this is a path. Um, that it sounds like the exact same thing, just on a, on a l- larger scale, basically. 
Yeah, larger, larger scale, luckily. And I'm also being pulled in more directions, though. Um, so that's another element or variable to contend with. Um, do you think it's like in conflict with what we were saying about uh, knowing your identity? Um, do you feel like there's some way in which you can spread yourself too thin to your detriment? Or is this more of a case of like, take the opportunity when it's presented? Well, if you are doing so many things that you're doing and not like bringing your A game, then yeah. that's, I think that's where the detriment um, detriment happens for sure. So, and I've seen you, that a lot. So people who, yeah. ha, it's really hard to say no, especially when you've been working so hard to establish yourself, then opportunities happen and you're so mm -hmm. wired to say yes to all of them and make them all happen. But at a certain point, if you do that, they're, they're all going to start to suffer. So that's yeah. where it's a detriment, I think. This is probably really important for like aspiring musicians who are just starting their yes. music career too, because they're going to find themselves really like overwhelmed with options, um, especially today. And it's going to be a slow crawl if you're trying to ingratiate yourself into the social media world too. So it's like, okay, should I go all you know, how much effort should I put in before I realize, okay, this is actually the route that I need to take. Um, so it's, it's a good question and it's, it's a tough one to answer, but I, that's why I was like really curious on your thoughts. And I, I hope other people can sort of understand how to orient themselves maybe a little bit better too. Well, I've seen if, mixers uh, make this mistake where they're finally starting to get booked consistently after years of, uh, you know, basically having to do anything to get clients, now they're starting to be booked um, and uh, their schedule is full and they just keep saying yes to more and more and more projects to where things start to overlap and they start to deliver things late to certain, to some of the clients or start to burn out and do a worse job. And, uh, that's, that's a huge trap, but it goes against everything, uh, everything, you know, because it's been so hard to get to that point that like the thought of saying no to something is like cutting off a limb. And I think that, uh, it's a, it's, it's a similar thing, um, for musicians, but there is a way I think to, to, I guess keep your eye open for the right opportunity without spreading yourself too thin and continually moving forward. But it takes awareness. Um, it takes awareness and like asking yourself those questions. Yeah. And to be really keyed into your, your gut and your intuition. Yeah. But and at some point you just got to go for it. Like too, like you, you do have to just make a decision at some point. Yeah. Do you think it's best to take on too much? And then if you find yourself way too overwhelmed, then you whittle it back yeah. instead of denying. Yeah. The, totally. The job. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Um, I'm sure a lot of people find themselves in that uh, situation. It, yeah. I, I've known some, some mixers too, who like, you know, have gone through that experience of like, well, you know, I'm getting so many clients. They're not like the level of client that I would like. Um, is this, you know, when, when people start to get so many like inquiries, would you say like, okay, now's the time to like, raise my rate or, uh, do I just deny, keep everything the same and just stick with where I'm at? I, I guess it's like, it's a good way to assess or it's a good opportunity to assess like your yeah. worth too. Yeah. I mean, you could try raising your rate and see what happens. It could be that ever that suddenly no one wants to work with you. Uh, it could also be that, um, you know, maybe you lose the bottom 15% of those clients, but the good ones stick. Like you don't know till you try, but definitely um, I think that your level of demand uh, should is like a good clue 
to yeah. raise rates. I mean, if you're getting to that point where you have too much to do, you know, session musician too, it doesn't, whoever you are, that that is the point to where getting you should be more pricey. Yeah. Yeah. I experienced that with teaching too. Um, How so? To, like just booked out? Yeah. Like completely booked out. And I was like, maybe I'm way undervaluing myself, but I also just feel bad uh, raising my rate for people who want to learn how to play. Cause it's like, I don't know. That's, that's a whole other conversation. Um, should raise your but, rate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did raise uh, it. And then I, ex- I fully expected a bunch of people to be like, Ugh. and then they were like, that's fine. Yeah, that's cool. And I was like, and yeah, I thought it was exactly. a, a sub. Yeah. And I was like, that, that doesn't make, me, I was hoping people would drop off because <laughs> I'm too, too busy. Um, but then everyone basically stuck around and I was like, well, here we are. So I still feel too bad to raise it more. So I, I just tell people I can't do it now. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Well, there's that, <laughs> there's that too. You can always just say no. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to know, uh, what, you know, what to say no to, what to say yes to. Um, but yeah, yeah, those are, I guess those are my own problems. Well, I mean, uh, that's where knowing your brand matters, right? That's where having your identity, uh, figured out and knowing your brand and being like in touch with your goals and your personality and all those things. That's, that's where that matters because, uh, at least for me, um, that makes it easier to know what to, what to lean into. Cause at any given time, there's so many different things I could be working on. There's so many people coming at me with stuff that like could be cool. But, um, if I was to say yes to everything, it would be a total disaster. It would yeah. be an absolute disaster. Like everyone would suffer. So I, what can I do besides, so some things have actual metrics where that makes sense, but also I just got to think about what's, uh, what are the things that are going to get me to actually, uh, you know, be present mentally to where I'll actually do a good job. Cause I've said yes to things that seem cool on paper, but like, I just mentally can't like, I, I feel like I'm wasting everybody's time. And it kind of sucks, but like, it's just not, it's hard. I think that's part of that discipline thing we were talking about earlier. My ADD is such that if I'm not excited about something, it's really, really, really tough to, uh, to get the light bulb to come on. I completely agree. I think that's why I've allowed myself to not have this sort of, uh, parental discipline, Uh, so to speak with myself, because I get the best results whenever I just pursue whatever I'm most excited about. Um, I even say, I said that to uh, all of my students too. It was like, cause they would ask me, what should my practice routine be? And I was like, don't get too set on a particular routine because you're going to find yourself being like really called to this one thing. What if you really want to write one day? What if you really just are motivated to drilling a technique? Just do that until you want to capitalize on what you're most excited about and where your focus is really going to be utilized. Um, so I completely agree with that. There's like an element of like, you, you just have to be excited about it, especially when you're trying to develop a skill or be, especially if you're trying to be creative, you know, if something calls for creativity, you can't, you can force it. People say that, you know, like, uh, summoning the muse or whatever, and like putting in the hours, like it's a job and yeah, that works too. But ultimately you want to really capitalize on that moment where you're like so stoked to do something. That's where you'll get the, I think you'll get the best results from that. For Um, For sure. I think that the, uh, the the discipline is for when you're not feeling the spark, but you still got to make progress. It'll it like will save your ass from stagnating. 
um, you know, that's, that's where I think a practice routine helps is, uh, like days where you're not there mentally. So you've got this routine to fall back on, but, um, but when you are, when the light bulb is on, I think that's when it is important to, to follow that. And really it comes down to what's going to keep you coming back and like keep you doing the work the most. Is it the thing that excites you or is it some routine uh, that might not excite you? You know, I think some people are much better with routine actually and habit and stuff. And uh, like they're not into being creative. So like I, I know a few people who they function better that way. I'm kind of jealous of them. I I actually oscillate back and forth between mm-hmm. those two modalities. Like there are sometimes weeks where I'm not feeling creative at all, but I get such a rush from, it's almost like going to the gym, but for guitar yeah, or music. Same. It's, yeah. And it's, it's good to have both of those uh, options that you could lean on in times where you're not feeling the other. Uh, and then there's some t- yeah, there's times where I completely reject, uh, routine and structure. And it's, it's a weird thing. You have to be very observant of your own brain, um, and make sure that you're not, you know, going too long without one thing or the other and assessing, you know, where you are in, in that process of like, Okay, am I starting to get burnt out on this? Um, should I switch to doing something else? Uh, but but yeah, having having those two things is is great, and uh, it it sounds like you have both, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. it, it goes back and forth. Um, like I can get ridiculous with the practice routine, with like the spreadsheets and like the tracking is like uh, it some people have made fun of me, but like, I need that. If I don't do that, like if I don't do that, um, I, I don't do the, do that stuff. Like I, I will not sit there and do the discipline work side of guitar without having that kind of insane structure. But then when it comes to writing, it's like none of that whatsoever. Totally. Yeah. It's weird. I almost like, wonder if I should be worried about like the bipolarity of that, uh, thing that you're describing in, in myself at least. And I can even, what's funny. Worried about as you were what? Saying, oh, just like how, how drastic of oh, a okay. shift that it, it is that takes place. Um, but yeah, it's funny. Like I can even, this is extremely random, but, uh, I can even like tell when I'm in that very regimented mode, Uh, I'm like that with collecting data about my like health and even like tracking my food Mm -hmm. and stuff. Like I'll, I'll track the exercise that I did, my sleep, my, all this and calories and blah, blah, blah. And like, I can actually go into my logs. I'll be like, Oh, I was in like a structured mood this week because I tracked everything meticulously. And then like a few days later, like zero. (laughs) And then it's the same thing with guitar playing. Uh, like I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll have like a list of exactly what I want to accomplish and I'll be like, okay, I want to practice this for 30 minutes, metronome, as soon as I wake up, you know, all that stuff. And then like, I'll be in a writing mode and I'll go into my like studio one session or a pro tool session or something. And it's so disorganized and it's like, a yeah, like an idiot set it up. It's just <laughs> so all over the place. And it's like it, the, yeah, the, the contrast between those two modalities is it's funny when you observe it in yourself. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's kind of necessary to have that because otherwise you go crazy. If, at least maybe I would go crazy. I, if I just, I would too. You know. So I, I track everything as well. Like my, like I, I don't feel like I did it, the thing, unless I track it. It's weird. I, I, yeah, it's, it's like you need to have, um, that written validation that you can go back to. It's like a little dopamine hit that you get when you go back and you look at how productive you were, like Mm -hmm. the list of all the things you did, even if it's just track, you're like, I did, I ate good that day, dude. And you know, like I, it's just it's like a little reward system that you're setting up for yourself. Um, and it keeps you coming back to doing it even when it is in a regimented way. So 
um, maybe there's something to be learned. From I, I think that. so. <laughs> like, well, so look at my girlfriend and she track. Oh, she tracks some things, but not stuff like food. And she's just like good about it. She just, she's just good about it. And, uh, I know quite a few people who are just good about it. They, uh, they just have a good sense for it, but that's not me. Like, so tracking is the only way, like tracking is the only way. And it's the same with everything. It's the same with guitar. It's the same with exercise. It's the same with anything, anything that requires, uh, discipline, um, anything that like requires, uh, like kind of doing the same thing a lot or where you really shouldn't like, yeah, like with food, like, yeah, it may be once in a while you can go off the rails, but uh, you really shouldn't do that very often. I have to track it or I will go off the rails. I'll go off the rails with literally everything if I don't track it. But the thing is for writing, it's good to go off the rails. Yeah. It's this constant like conflict between I guess this is also like a cliche and a trope but uh the chaos and the orderliness of uh the person uh, of of the individual right like everyone has that sort of dichotomy and um just being aware uh, not, keeping those two things in balance is important um and yeah, I, I I totally agree with all that, and I, I relate to all those things. So if you things. don't track, just curious, if you don't track your results, do you go off the rails, or like, do, are you good at like keeping it together without basically I, those uh, those? Uh, I used to. Used to. Oh, okay. Without those without those guardrails. Yeah, guardrails. Yeah. 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 So I used to absolutely, um, and the accountability is like the main feature I think there or um, that's, that's keeping things in place. Right. At least I think that's psychologically what's going on. It's like, you don't want to, if you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to track this. And this of course applies to uh, guitar playing, practicing, like logging your activity, logging your um, yeah, your writing sessions, practice sessions, whatever it might be. Um, but that accountability, you don't want to look back at that, that day with disappointment in yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be like, ah, oh, I let that shit go. And I totally could have done better. It was just pure laziness. And in the moment, like you have no accountability, no one's watching you. And, uh, so it's so easy to do the thing that is easy, right? And yes. not the thing where you're forcing yourself to do something that is mildly uncomfortable in that moment. Um, but then if you tell yourself, like, if there is that built in accountability, like, OK, I'm, I'm going to look back at this later with <laughs> maybe people would think this is a bad way to go about doing this. But with like some guilt of not, you know, maximizing my time not, you know, doing the thing that I know I was cap fully capable of doing, um, then, you know, you're not, it's, you just don't want to set yourself up for that guilt later on. And so, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, everything you're saying, I just realized I've, um, for anyone listening, uh, who wants to have any sort of self-directed career, like anything entrepreneurial, being a producer, a musician, you're basically answering to nobody but yourself 90% of the time. So, or more, usually more. It's not, you don't have, you generally won't have a boss. Like if you don't impose this on yourself, nobody else is going to. Um, I did this uh, 75 hard program with a friend of mine who is a uh, career military and, uh, and he told me that it was harder than basic training. I said, no, no way that this is harder. Like, because that, that's like 16 hours a day and like actually difficult. And he said, no, it's harder because I could just not do it. Like in basic, like I had people yelling at me and we were terrified of not doing things because it would suffer a lot if we didn't do things. But like with this, it's like, yeah, I could just not do it. 
Yeah. Consequence is a powerful motivator. Yeah. And so you, you have to keep the consequence in mind, uh, which is like, imagine your life if you didn't do anything, right? Imagine like the sad state you would be in if you just let everything slip by you, you know, and that's what you need. That's the motivator. It's not like the drill sergeant yelling at you, but that is what takes that place. You know, um, maybe I, I am like a generally like kind of an anxious person. So I think about those things a lot. Um, I think about like what could happen if I did or didn't do mm-hmm. this. Um, and so I think that is a positive element of anxiety until it, that also can go off the rails, of course. But you do need a little bit of that, like reminder of like, here's what your life could be. If, uh, like say you quit your job, which I did, uh, I had like a, oh my God, I hated this job so much. I had like a nine to five, um, not for, dude, not for very long. Uh, I, I, like day two or it was sincerely day two or three, I was still in training for it. Uh, I had this thought like, oh fuck, I have to quit. I have to quit. Yeah. This isn't good. Uh, I can't do this. And, but I stuck it out for like nine months or something like that. That's um, impressive. I, yeah. Well, it's because uh, the person who vouched for me to get that job, I didn't want to like make that person look bad. Yeah. Um, Fair so enough. I, I felt like I had to stick it out for at least that long and they were still pissed at me for leaving. Um, but whatever. It is what it is. But why did I start talking about this? Uh, because Shit. we're talking about the structure and consequences and what your life oh. could be. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a nine to five and you're like, I can't do this and you quit and you're, you're trying to be a musician, right. To pursue some sort of, you know, uh, entrepreneurial career, you have to have that, that same accountability that you had at that other job. And even more so, cause it's like, Okay, now you have to picture what life would be like if you didn't have the security of that job and you also didn't accomplish what you sought out to do initially. So I don't know how what a healthy way necessarily of going about uh, doing that is. But I think keep at least when you start to feel yourself um, like you're like, ah. I, I, I just, I'm going to like watch YouTube videos all day instead of like practicing or making social media content or mixing or whatever it is. Um, you know, you have to think like, nah, well, if I enough of these decisions and here's where I'll end up just like uh, with a roommate at age 45 or something, you know, yeah. <laughs> you don't want that dark, dark stuff. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And that, uh, it's very real too. Um, I, you know, I think the terror, that terror that you're talking about, you didn't say terror, but for me, it's terror. Like sure. those thoughts are, are terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge I, motivator. I, yeah. Yeah. But it's so easy to just put it out of your mind if you're not a naturally like very neurotic, anxious person. Um, but yeah, I think maybe that is also like a common trait amongst, um, uh, people like, I don't know, entrepreneurial, um, self-employed people in music, uh, just the, the anxiety is what pushes you perhaps. Oh, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, uh, we're getting pretty philosophical today. I think about I this think. shit all, all the time. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. like the, because it's, uh, once you're aware of these things, it's like uh, you can't become unaware of it. Like once you become aware of uh, those consequences, like how can you just not not know about that? Like, yeah. And oh, sorry, did I oh. interrupt you? Oh, oh well, uh, what you were saying before about like, um, do you go off the rails if you don't track or something? Um, and same thing with music. And all of that as well. Um, at first, that accountability is the thing like that produces that 
terror, as you describe. Mm-hmm. And then eventually it just becomes part of what you do. And then you become like a, almost addicted to, um, you, you feel bad not doing the, the correct thing that you know is correct. Um, so uh, over time you modify, you intentionally modify your behavior in the beginning and then it becomes habit over time. And then you can't not do the thing. Hey, people talk about this with the gym all the time. You know, it's like, I can't not exercise now once you've done it enough, but those first, you know, maybe even months are torturous. It's like, I don't want to do this at all. Um, it's just establishing new habits. Um, uh, and I guess people more qualified than me have talked about this at length as well. So <laughs> it's, it, it, it's true though. It's the same thing. It's absolutely, it's absolutely the same thing. Um, this honestly, this is kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today, uh, because um, you don't have a day job, and you know you've managed to make guitar. You know, there's other things that you do along with guitar, like video, but it's all in the service of music, and uh, you've managed to make it work. So I think that's uh, I, I'm always impressed whenever someone has pulled it off and continues to pull it off. So I uh, like, it's interesting to me to hear how their brain works. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about that more than like too much guitar stuff, because at the end of the day, the, a podcast isn't better than a video for, you know, if someone wants to learn really what you're doing on guitar. There's a lot of video on that. So that, and that's going to be better than talking about it on a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Yeah. It's not like we were going to start talking about pick slanting and economy of motion and all that. Um, but we could, <laughs> yeah, but without ahead. like a visual reference and without actually hearing it and all that, like, it's just not, it's not as good. Uh, this was a realization I came to with URM podcast after a while was we started doing technical stuff at the beginning uh, kind of, and then, but we also had nail the mix and we had like video content. That's just like so far superior to a podcast. I think a podcast is best when you're getting like somebody's uh, take on things. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's why I listen to podcasts too. It's not to get those more like the technical minutia. It's a, uh, is to see like how their brain works and whatnot. So yeah, no, I, I agree that this, you know, this is not a bad route to take by any means. And I, I, I just hope somebody gets something from it. Um, uh, which I'm sure. You, you I'm, had a lot I'm of sure. I'm advice. sure somebody will. Somebody. Yeah. <laughs> but I, somebody think, somebody. I think it's a good place to end the conversation, but, uh, I want to thank you very much for taking the time and, uh, Good luck with that Arch Echo tour. That sounds that sounds intimidating and awesome. Yeah, that's how I would describe it. Yes. Yeah, Thank both you. those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was great being here. Thanks so much for having me on, man. Anytime.